Good morning, church family. Good we morning. are so glad you guys are here. Yes. I'm Jeremy. I'm Kim. This is Kim. And we're here to welcome you oh. and give you some announcements. Yes. Want to let you guys know that October 31st at 7 a.m. in the morning, uh, we are joining together for a prayer on the courthouse lawn. This is kind of wrapping up our churches on this 40 days of prayer, and we're inviting other churches. We're coming together, collaborating, and just um, just gonna pray together. I think that's so important, especially right now, all times. But to, you know, we all have our different nuances and how we see things. But to come together, unified, praying is always. A and you know what else happens on October 31st? What? Sweets and treats. Yeah. October 31st, 5 to 6.30 p.m. Mm -hmm. Sweets and treats is happening and we need candy. Candy. We have like 10% of the candy we need. So that's like 10,000 out of 100,000 pieces of candy. So we need a lot more candy. So bring candy to the church. There's little buckets everywhere. That's not a snack for Sunday morning. You're supposed to drop candy in there. So bring candy. And also, if you would rather not shop for candy, you can just donate money to the church earmarked for candy. Yes. And yes. we'll go buy the candy for you. Yep. So we still need volunteers too. We also so do. So you yes. can email Missy if you would like to volunteer. To yes. Treats. Yep. We're so glad you guys are here. Welcome. Yep. Welcome. Good morning, church family. My name is Rebecca Preston. October 11th is Pastor Appreciation Day. In honor of this date, we want to bless all of our staff members here at First Baptist Bolivar. We are having a card shower during the month of October. In the hallway of the main worship center and at the Esquire, you will find boxes with slits at the top, their names and titles written on the boxes where you may drop your cards in. There is cardstock provided near the boxes for you to use so you can write your encouraging notes to our ministry and support staff here at FBC. You might also use your own cards if you desire. If you're watching online, you may also drop your cards off at the church office or mail them in. Just please make sure to indicate that they're for the staff card shower. Please join us in blessing our staff with a note of encouragement as 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13 says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist. We're so glad you're here. If this is one of your first times worshiping with us or watching online, then we want to invite you to visit our website, fbcboliver.org. On the website, you'll find many ways that you can get more connected with our church family. We'd love that. Um, let's begin this morning with a reading from God's Word, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's stand together. We've gathered to worship. Let's stand and sing of his wonderful grace.
continue our worship by singing a favorite hymn, another one proclaiming his amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. So glad to see you this morning. Those of you worshiping by live stream, welcome. Those on KYO Radio, um, we're grateful that you're listening in with us as well um, today. Um, in life of our church this week, um, I wanted to make sure that you heard that Ellie Blevins' Celebration of Life service will be held on Saturday the 17th at 10 a.m. Um, at the um, American Legion Hall. Um, on West Broadway by the library. So, friends of Ellie, we want to pray for her and her family. Also, you may have heard yesterday that a former um, SBU football player and coach on Robert's staff, um, currently a coach at Travis High School in Texas, was shot and killed on Saturday afternoon at a sports complex in Rosenberg, Texas, Derwin Lauderdale. And some of you may know Derwin or have known him. I believe he's around... 29, 30 years old. And so, Derwin, we want to pray for Derwin's family, um, for Robert and Christy Clardy, their entire SBU football family, as well as they grieve this tragedy that's happened um, to Derwin, um, this senseless tragedy that's happened. So we want to pray for, for these folks as well. 
Um, on, on behalf of the Callahan family, Brenda and Dennis Owens, Rob and Donna Callahan, I bring you their greetings today um, after we did Bob's service um, on Friday. And so they're grateful for your prayers um, in their life um, as, as well. We want to continue to pray for our nation for this election cycle um, that we're in. Um, we want to continue just to lift up our nation and to ask the Lord to draw people to him during this time. We're continuing to read our devotions, and those books are still available. If you'd like one, you can catch up quickly. Um, they're very short, very brief, and very worth, worthwhile. So we're going to be continuing our study in Second Peter today. And after I finish praying, Brett's going to follow up and read a passage of scripture. One of the benefits of preaching through books of the Bible is that you have to deal with passages that you would really not like to deal with. This is a hard passage of scripture today. And it's hard because it talks about God's judgment on the wicked. And so as you listen to Brett read the word, Part of our praying and part of what Peter will say in chapter 3 is that we pray for God's, God is being patient and merciful so that people can turn to him. But today we hear the reality that God knows how to rescue the godly and he knows how to bring judgment on the wicked. So after I pray, you'll hear God's word. And so I just want to set the stage a little bit with that remark for you. Let's pray together. I'm also quite sure that you've brought things in your life into worship today. I want to invite you to pray over those things that are causing you anxiety and stress and worry in these days. Peter teaches us in his first letter to cast our cares on him because he cares for us. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to be in, in your house, to gather with your people, Lord, even across the airwaves and by internet. Thank you for gathering us together, even gathering us in the theater. Bless our brothers and sisters who are there um, as well this morning. Father, we are your people. You are our God. Lord, once we were not a people, but now we are your people. Once we were in darkness, but now we've been brought into your marvelous light through faith in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your amazing grace that has made this happen. We thank you that this grace is so marvelous, Lord and the change that it's brought in our lives. Thank you that we are not the people that we used to be. And we may not all be who we want to be yet, Lord, but we are certainly being changed by you. Lord, we bring our anxieties and worries and stress, concerns, Lord, the danger that we might feel, the fear that we might have in this time. All of these things we bring into our worship today, Lord, and we give them to you. We ask, Lord, that as we hear your word, that it might build our trust in who you are and what you've done for us in Christ. We ask, Lord, in this time that you might, Lord, continue to strengthen us, God, with, with goodness and with self-control, with perseverance and patience, Lord, with brotherly love and with agape love. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity for us to pray for our nation, to pray for our president, our senators, our congressmen, Lord, we, we ask, Lord, that you would work in divine ways, Father. We ask, Lord, that during this time that, that people might come to the end of themselves and trying to figure things out and might turn to you and by faith put their trust in you. We pray for Mike and Teresa during this time as well, Lord, and ask your blessings on them, strengthen them and hold them up in this time, protect them. Lord, we pray in our local community, Father, for those who are suffering from covid from those who are quarantined because of it. We ask, God, for your healing mercy to be upon them, and not only here, Lord, but in our state and in our nation and around the world. We, we pray, Lord, that, that you might yet deliver us from this, Lord. We pray for those scientists also, Lord, who are working on vaccines. We, we believe your deliverance could come through that way as well. We pray that you might protect them and watch over them in that. Lord, thank you for the opportunity that we have to open our hearts to what you want to teach us. Help us to heed the warning from your word today. Lord, help us to heed the reassurance that comes from hearing your word. Help us not to be hearers only, Lord, but to be doers of your word. Thank you for these moments to be in worship together. We love you, Lord. Thank you for hearing us in Jesus' name and for your love for us first. Amen.
Our focus scripture comes from 2 Peter chapter 2, uh, read verses 1 through 9. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, for that righteous man, living among them day after day, was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. Let's stand together. We're going to proclaim truth by singing, This I Believe.
to 2 Peter this morning and be in God's word together. We will grow in godliness and grace when we know who not to follow and how to recognize godly guidance for our spiritual growth. I realize that not every Sunday morning do you come and hear a passage like that read publicly um, to us. But as Peter is writing to these believers in the first century world who are enduring persecution and trials under the leadership of Nero at that time, he wants to not only encourage their growth in godliness and grace, but he wants to warn them about false prophets and false teachers among them. And so this morning, I want us to talk about who not to follow. And I want us to receive this warning about ungodly leadership. And I want us to embrace the reassurance that God can be depended on to handle judgment on the wicked and the rescue of the righteous. So we begin in verse 1 of chapter 2, remembering that last week Peter had talked about his own experience of seeing Jesus in his glory, what it's going to be like when we see him in the second coming as he was transfigured before them. And as Peter is describing this, he says, but even greater than my personal experience of seeing Jesus in all his glory is all of the glory that we have in the scripture. We have this word of the prophets, chapter 1, verse 19 says, made more certain, and you do well to pay attention to it, Peter says. Peter finishes that first chapter, verse 21, for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke of God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter is saying that the prophets of old, they didn't prophesy on their own behalf, but God moved in them. He breathed into them the message that he wanted others to receive through them. And so we believe that Peter, being carried along by God's spirit, gives, these, gives us these words. Notice in verse, verse 1 the reality of false teaching. Realize that false teaching is present. Peter says, but there are also false prophets among the people, speaking about in the past, just as there will be false teachers among you in the future as well. He says past and future, there will be false teaching, and he's going to talk about it in the present tense as well, past, future, and present. He gives this descriptive, non-exhaustive list of identifying traits of what false teachers would look like and what they were doing actually in their midst. Now let me just say, this is one of those passages that it's, it's more difficult to bridge into our contemporary setting, but we do know that there is false teaching in Christianity among us as well. We, we have people who believe that um, the more that you give to God is the more that he's gonna give to you, and, and, and also if you'll give to the preacher too. We don't believe that the prosperity gospel is the gospel. We, we also don't believe that you can live any way you want to and, and, and uh, say that you're a, a follower of Jesus. There are some who says you can believe in, in, in God and live however you want to. There are others who, who teach that you can go your own way and don't worry about it. You're going to end up someday in heaven with the rest of them. We call that universalism. We must be aware that there's false teaching among us as well. I'm very aware that some of you listen to all kinds of podcasts and teachings and watch on television. You must be aware. You must know the gospel so well yourself so that you can screen what you heard taught to you. Even when it comes from this pulpit by this preacher. Now, listen to these traits. There are several of them that are listed here. The first one is they teach heresy. Heresy is false doctrine. It is pseudo-truth. It is not truth. It is false. It's false doctrine. Such as Peter said last week, and we'll see again in chapter 3 in a few weeks, that they deny the second coming. 
that Jesus isn't coming again. That's why Peter said, I saw what he's going to look like when he arrives, and you'll believe it then. They denied the second coming. You know, often I, I, I notice that when people believe wrongly about the gospel, that their lives show that too. That they don't live lives that reflect the goodness and the greatness and the grace of God, but they live however they want to. Peter alludes here that there's immor immorality that's connected to this heresy. As if you can believe whatever you want to and live however you want to and it's all okay with God. Brothers and sisters, it is not. Don't believe that lie. It's a lie of our enemy. Jesus said he was a liar from the beginning. They teach heresy. A chief among the heresies that they teach, Peter says that they deny, he says, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. They deny his lordship. What Peter means by this, and by the way, the word that's translated here from the original is the, where we get the word despot. They deny the one who is the master and ruler of all in their lives. It's as if they would say to Jesus, hey, Jesus, get up on that cross and die for my sins, but I'm going to live any way I want to. Thank you very much. That is a heresy. Now, I'm not asking you to judge anybody else's life other than your own. But one of the ways that we can judge heresy is when people say one thing and do another. That can be a way that we can discern what is truth and what is false. And, and notice that this is very popular. They, they deny the sovereign Lord Jesus. Notice that Peter says, who bought them. He uses the language of the marketplace. That the innocent one, the Lord Jesus, God's own son, in place of the guilty, me and all the rest of us, the innocent one gave his life all our sin put on him. And he purchased for us our rescue, our deliverance. This is what Jesus did. And Peter says they deny his lordship even though he bought them. Even though he purchased them. Even though he redeemed them back from it. Verse 2 says that many will follow their shameful ways. You can draw a crowd preaching what people want to hear. You can, you can make lots of people happy by telling them what they believe is the truth instead of teaching them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They teach heresy. They deny the sovereign Lord. They're, they're popular. They draw a crowd. People flock to them. And they bring disrepute to the way of truth. Jim Samra says that they discredit the gospel by what they teach, and by how they live. Verse 3 says that in their greed, these teachers are deceptive and they exploit. They're greedy for money. They're greedy to misuse their power, their control, their authority. They're greedy for prestige, to be seen, to be known. They make up stories, Peter goes so far to say. They'll do whatever they have to do to deceive, to swindle, to abuse. We, we live in a day and time where we're aware that spiritual leaders have misused their authority and their power and have traumatized people who are under their watch care. Peter says that these false teachers happened in the Old Testament. They're going to happen in the Future Testament for, the, for the, the first century believers. And brothers and sisters, it can happen among us as well. That is why all of us must know the gospel. All of us must understand who Jesus is and what he has done for us. So that we can all guard the truth of the gospel. Now certainly the under shepherd should guard the gospel as well. And his life should reflect the life of Jesus as well. But Peter says something else before he moves on to talk about three examples. He says that the judgment of those who are false teachers is sure and it awaits them. Look at verse 4. 
the end of verse 3, excuse me. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. It's that sure. It's right there waiting for them. Why? Because they've brought this on themselves. Verse 1 says, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Now, this is just Peter's overview of these identifying traits. The rest of chapter 2 that we didn't read today that we'll talk about next week goes into identifying who these false teachers are and what they're like. And Peter's going to use some very vivid language next week as we explore even more about who not to follow. Peter advances his argument by saying we can depend on God to handle judgment on the wicked. And he gives three examples of this. They're very succinct case studies. Peter knows that God has a a, a faithful record, a track record, a faithful history of dealing with the wicked and protecting his people. And so to give evidence of this, so that these false teachers might be having a heyday now, but their day is coming. And Peter describes three scenarios. Now, why he chose these three, it must have been under the leadership of the Spirit. But I think there's another reason too, and I'll show you that in just a minute as well. First in verse four, he begins by starting with um, a first class conditional sentence. What that means is the word if from the, from the original language and our language, it can be translated since. For since God did not spare angels... When they sin, but sent them to hell, this is the Greek word Tartarus. It's from mythology in Greek. It was the place where the evil wicked went after they died. Peter uses this phrase that we translate hell into our language because it was the word that was used in the language of his people. These angels who rebelled against God. You say, well, preacher, when did that happen? Where's that in the Bible? Well, some people point to Genesis 6. But there was, some, there, was, there was an episode that happened in Genesis 6 at the beginning of that chapter. Some say, no, no, it's in Isaiah 14 when Isaiah the prophet is describing when Satan and his angels were kicked out of heaven. Um, we're not told specifically when it was, only that it happened, that they sinned against God. They rebelled against God. And these angels, even these angels, Peter says, if God didn't spare angels... But sent them to hell, putting them to the gloomy, chainy dungeons to be held for judgment. He's with them for the first, the first. You can find this also in Jude verse 6 as well um, in in your scriptures also. He uses the fallen angels. And that God knows how to even punish beings that were created to worship him and to serve as his messengers. That they don't get a pass if they decide to rebel. And since God will deal with fallen angels this way, and, if, and since he will not spare the ancient world, but he brought a flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, Noah, Mrs. Noah, his three sons, and their wives. There's a television show in that title somewhere. Um, but the, uh, if God wouldn't spare the ungodly people there, And then verse 6 is the third one. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, notice that he rescued Noah and his family. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men. Now, if you read in Genesis 18 and 19, and you read about Lot, and you'll think, that guy is righteous? See, righteous isn't ours Righteousness isn't ours because of how we act. It's ours because of who we put our trust in and who we believe in. Remember that when you get to that passage and you read about Lot and some of the things that he was involved in. But you know what? The trauma of living in Sodom and Gomorrah, what it was like to live around gross immorality on a regular basis, impacted Lot, the scripture says in verse 8. For that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. These three case studies, if God will judge fallen angels and judge, judge the, the ancient world in Noah's day and judge Sodom and Gomorrah and rescued Noah and rescued Lot, if God can do that, then the rest of the sentence is in verse 9. If he can do that, then God knows how to judge the wicked now. 
and he will. Where do you think Peter decided to come up with these examples? Man, those are some pretty wild examples, aren't they? Not every Sunday you come to church and you hear those examples, right? Somebody do this because it's not, all right? Here's where Peter got them. Turn to Luke chapter 22. It's good to be curious about things like this. How would Peter just, you know, bring these? You know, did the Spirit just say, use these? I think it's because he also heard Jesus use them. In Luke chapter 22, verses 26 through 30, I want you to hear Jesus' voice as well. Jesus speaking, speaking about the coming kingdom, his second coming. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark, and then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. That's where Peter got those examples. He had heard Jesus use those examples in his teaching and in his preaching about God's ability to judge the wicked. We can trust God to rescue the godly and bring justice on the wicked. And in these days, there are some things that I hear during the week and I hear on our news and I, and I pray, you know what, God? It's time to rev up and go get them. Now, that's some pretty aggressive praying, I know. And, and if you don't have thoughts like that, thoughts of righteous indignation, thoughts about God, rise up and strike the wicked. Look what they're doing. Look how they mock you and defy you. Now, I don't walk around in that all day long, but I have some moments like that. Peter is saying, because there are false teachers that are real, that are teaching an anti-gospel, it can lead us to have moments like that as well. Past, future, and present, God rescues and he brings justice. Peter warns them about these false teachers. Not everyone is from God who says they are. But Peter also reassures them and calls them to trust God, trust his watch care, to trust his justice, and to trust his mercy. You know what I find? God is rarely interested in my instructions to him. He really doesn't need my help. But you know what I need? I need to confess those things to him. And I need to ask him, to move and act like he moved in dealing with these angels, like he did in dealing in Noah's day, like he did on Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I know those three case examples bring up lots of unanswered questions. Did you notice that, that Peter wasn't interested in giving a justification to any of those things? Did you hear Jesus say he believed that Noah was real and that, that the ark was real? Did you hear him say that? Did you hear Jesus uh, claim the flood was true as well? That Sodom and Gomorrah were such wicked cities that God obliterated them. Brothers and sisters, these are not just legends or fantasies or myths. If God brought justice on those people in order to be just, then he must bring his justice to bear on some things in our world as well. And he will. You say, well, why hasn't that happened yet? Well, that's for chapter three in a few weeks, and we'll get there. And I'm not going to answer that question yet. In the few minutes that we have left, though, I do want to say something. Today I've been telling you about who not to follow. And I've been telling you how, how, to, uh, how to know that you can be reassured about God's faithfulness to judge the wicked and to rescue um, his people and protect his people. So this warning about ungodly leadership, I want to do the converse. Conversely, what do we look for in godly guidance and leadership that we should follow? so that you can use it as a filter to whoever you listen to for your spiritual growth as well. 
um, for a filter that you can use in our worship as well. As you listen to the teaching and preaching from this pulpit, what should you be looking for? So what I've done is I've taken the opposites from the list I gave you and who not to follow, and I've just flipped them to their positive opposite. And here's, here's where it comes up with. Instead of teaching heresy, we want to follow the godly guidance and leadership of people who focus on and defend the truth of the gospel. And did you know that, that for you to do that, you've got to know the gospel. You've got to know God's word. You do. You can't depend on just me to know that or a few other people who teach you. You must know it as well so that you can discern for yourself. Is what that person's saying true or not? Does it measure up to God's word or is that man's idea in teaching? They must be able to focus on and defend the truth of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, in this day, we must guard the truth of the gospel. Godly guidance and leadership should also affirm the deity and the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it should point people to Jesus, not to the leader. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me as I follow Christ. We can measure and gauge our people pointing people to the sovereign lordship of Jesus Christ or are they pointing to themselves. The fourth thing that I think that we can look for in godly leadership and, and guidance is do they bring honor to the way of the truth? Jesus said that he is the only way, that he is the truth, that he is the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him do they bring honor to the way of the truth? Uh, I, I like, I think it was Jim Sommer or maybe Jim Shaddix who said that they live a gospel, credible life and witness. That's who we should be looking for to lead us spiritually. Two other ways that they, they do this, how they live a gospel, credible life, is contentment. Rather than being greedy, that they're content that there's a generosity in their leadership. There's a generosity in their resources. There's a generosity in their relationships because they have integrity, a wholeness, a strength that is absent of deception, exploitation, and manipulation. They look out for what is best for others and not what is best for themselves. Now you say, Billy, where are those in the text? Those are not in the text. Those are the opposites of the one I described to you in verses one through three. That all I did was flip those around to their positive opposite. That's where I got those from. I wanted to end on a positive note. I wanted you to see that it is possible to discern who is a false teacher by how they teach and how they live and who is a teacher of the gospel truth by what they teach and how they live. And I want you to be equipped to be able to discern who that is so that you can know who to follow and who not to follow. So brothers and sisters, I've warned you about ungodly leadership today. As your under shepherd, I don't want my life to be represented in this list. As your under shepherd, I want you to be equipped so that you can filter gospel truth and know that it is from the spirit and not from a false teacher. I want you to know that from every place that you get spiritual truth in your life. I want you to be able to filter that as well. Next week, we're going to continue along this theme about these warnings about who not to follow because Peter, man, he gets very descriptive and very vivid going into some other identifying characteristics of these leaders, and we'll look at those next week. Suffice it to say today, who are you following? Make sure that they defend and uphold the truth of the gospel. Let's pray together. I give you just a few moments just to think on this word. Say, man, how does that apply to me today, Pastor? Listen, what you believe connects to how you behave. 
If Jesus has saved you from your sins, then he is Lord of all. So if you find yourself doing your own thing, going your own way, and saying, Jesus, thanks for that thing you did on the cross thing, but I'm going my own way, thank you very much, do not deny his lordship in your life. Repent from that, turn from that. That will lead to not good things happening in your life and your family. The word says that when we confess our sins, that God is the one who is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As a part of our worship today, if you've been denying his lordship, confess that, return to him. Maybe you're here for the first time or you're listening to this message for the first time. What Jesus did for you on the cross is for you. You don't have to live in God's condemnation. You don't have to wait for him to judge you eternally. You can find his forgiveness and his leadership now by putting your life into his trust, into his confidence, his help. Turn to him and say, Lord, I want to stop going my way and I want to come and go Jesus' way. You don't need any preacher words to do that. You use the words that are in your heart, be led by God's spirit to draw you to the light who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we come into your presence so grateful that we can know the truth of the gospel. And Lord, today we receive this warning about false teaching and about ungodly leadership. Lord, so that we will be warned to be very careful about who we allow to lead us and guide us spiritually. Lord, we ask for your help that in our church, for those who step into this pulpit and bring your words, that we would bring the whole counsel of the word of God to your people. Lord, we do believe in you. And we believe that you are coming again for us. Lord, help us not to be trapped in the teachings that are false around us in the 21st century. Instead, help us, Lord, to fall on our knees before you and to say thank you, Lord, for saving us and rescuing us and delivering us from this evil world. Help us, Lord, to live godly lives that reflect your great grace, your favor that has brought us into your family. Holy Spirit, Lead us and guide us in this truth that we've heard from Peter today so that we are reminded to follow Jesus. Lord, help us to be very guarded about following anyone else and especially those who teach and deny against his lordship. I ask your blessings on your people as they receive this this word. And Lord, as we sing, Father, about spiritual truth to one another, that we would recognize spiritual truth and walk in it. Thank you, Father, for these moments. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, let's worship together, and teach one another about what we believe in song. Come behold the wondrous mystery.
Amen. Church family, we want to thank you for joining us in worship this morning, both in the room and live streaming online. As we think about and try to process what we've received this morning from the word, I want to just encourage you that your pastoral staff and ministry staff, your core group leaders, your deacons, all those here at First Baptist Bolivar who are charged with stewarding over you with the gospel love you and want to go with you as you say yes to Jesus, as you say yes to the next steps that he has for you in your life. And so as you are working out the word received this morning, I would just encourage you to share that with someone, someone that will pray for you and minister to you, who will help you to say yes to whatever it is Jesus is asking for you, and maybe even help you to take those next best steps toward Christ. We would love to go with you. In just a moment, we're going to be dismissed. Of course, we're going to continue to do that from the back of the room to the front of the room. And as we go, we want to encourage our church family members and regular attenders that you can extend your worship this morning through giving. You can do that online or via text if you're joining us via the live stream. If you're in the room, of course, those are options for you as well. And there are buckets by the doors. And so we want to continue to invest in the advance of the gospel in our city and around the world. Before we go this morning, let's receive this benediction as we've heard a stern warning from the scriptures regarding false prophets and the false gospel. Let's hear this word from the Apostle Paul to his true son in the faith, Timothy, regarding the person and work of Christ. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Amen, church, and amen. We love y'all. Have a great week.